I'm June Gruber, an Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Colorado Boulder and Director of this Mental Health Expert Series. I'm delighted to be here today with Dr. Ann Kring, a Professor of Psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, to speak with her about her pioneering work in schizophrenia. So thanks for being here today, Ann. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the kind of mental health research and work that you do. Yeah, I've been studying uh, schizophrenia for a long time, too many years to, <laughs> to count <laughs> now. And um, what the focus of our work has been is to really try to understand the nature of emotion problems in uh, schizophrenia. Um, and we um, have uh, looked a lot at emotional expression in schizophrenia, emotional experience in schizophrenia, trying to pinpoint the nature of of where things may be uh, slightly off and then uh, move towards uh, developing interventions that might help to improve those things. So that's been the bulk of, of my work in, is in uh, severe mental illness and schizophrenia. And how did you go about first getting started in this work in schizophrenia and severe mental illness? I started it in graduate school, actually, um, and the irony is that when I went to graduate school, I went to a clinical psychology PhD program at Stony Brook, um, convinced that I wanted nothing to do with severe mental illness. Um, I wanted to study neuropsychology, and I thought severe mental illness would be um, just too uh, depressing. People would never get better. It was scary. Uh, and so that, that is the real irony. So that would be one piece of advice I would have to graduate students. You never know, uh, once you get into graduate school, you may end up doing something that uh, you, um, you were pretty sure you didn't want to do. But, um, but once I got to, to graduate school, I started reading about emotion and some of the emotional problems in schizophrenia. And then with the lab group, we wrote a grant together, uh, designed our first study, and then I was hooked. I just became fascinated by it and um, thought, you know, I could spend years trying to uh, get to the bottom of it. And as it turns out, I have. <laughs> so I still not to the bottom of it, but I have spent years, yeah. And, and over the years, you know, as you've been getting to the bottom of, you know, just the puzzles of emotion and schizophrenia, what have been some, you know, memorable frustrations or challenges along the way? And, and of course, successes that you've been able to savor. Some of the challenges have been, um, I would say, uh, you know, actually getting um, the field to believe uh, our findings. So, you know, one of our findings, um, what, what we did uh, is that we took some of the methods and theories from affective science and then applied them to the study of schizophrenia. Um, and so, we would you know, show emotionally evocative uh, materials to people with schizophrenia, and then we would ask them to tell us how they feel. And people said, well, how can you, you know, a person with schizophrenia, they, you know, their, their mind is all jumbled up. How could they possibly tell you how they feel? Um, so it took years for us to convince uh, the field um, that uh, you can trust, you know, the people uh, with schizophrenia have pretty uh, strong intuitions about how they're feeling, and they can report on them just the same way as, as somebody without schizophrenia has. So, I think that was some of the, the frustrations was um, uh, demonstrating that these methods um, can be used with a, a, a population of people who may have <clears throat> pretty profound cognitive uh, deficits, but yet who still can tell you how they feel. They can still report that quite clearly. Um, so, uh, and, and then I think some of the su successes followed on from, from some of those challenges. People finally started to uh, believe it, and other people started to adopt uh, some of the methods and and um, uh, procedures and um, tools that we were developing and using them and getting the same results. Uh, so once it wasn't just Ann Kring saying, oh, well, you got to believe this, uh, other people were finding the same thing. And of course, that's how science works. You want uh, things to be replicated. And then um, when with uh, additional uh, labs finding the same things, people really started to say, wow, that's that's really interesting, you know, that, that people with schizophrenia can report on their feeling and, and that yet they're not showing this outward expression of what can we do about that? So, so that, was, that was part of the success or at least some of the gratification that came when people really started to embrace it and then use it uh, most importantly to help improve the lives of, of people with schizophrenia. And one of the things I've always loved about your research as well is just, you know, in terms of, as you're saying, improve the lives of people with schizophrenia, also having a destigmatizing effect to really appreciate the rich inner emotional life that they have. Mm -hmm. 
absolutely. I think that was, you know, one of the things that was misunderstood for years, you know, the, because people with schizophrenia often, not all, but often will, uh, people with schizophrenia will not show very many outward expressions of emotion. And, and people just mistakenly assumed that their lives were emotionally dull, flat, void, you know, there was nothing going on there. Um, but as you just said, their, their lives are just as emotionally rich, if not more than, than people without. And um, I think to, to be able to uh, alert people to not make these mistaken assumptions and not to prioritize a, a, a clinician interview, say, over uh, what a person with schizophrenia has to say about their own experience has done a lot, uh, not just for the field, but for the people with schizophrenia and and, and people's families. So people, um, uh, family members who have someone with schizophrenia have for years been talking about how uh, you know, emotional my son or daughter or husband spouse is um, with you know, these very strong feelings. What do I do about them? And they were dismissed as well. Uh, so it's, it's, I think, been um, also important to, to, for families' voices to be heard about what it's like to live with their relative who may not be showing emotional uh, expressions, but yet reports feeling things very strongly. So, you know, along these lines, when you think about the work you've done and, and look forward, what do you see as the most important, you know, future directions in the field? Well, still, I would say just, uh, you know, there still needs to be more people uh, in psychology studying severe mental illness, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Uh, there just aren't that many people um, who are drawn to that. So if, if that, that remains a, a big challenge, we need more people doing this work. Um, and in specific to schizophrenia, we need more people to work on developing some psychosocial interventions. Um, medications have been around since the 1950s. Um, they, uh, they help with some of the symptoms, um, but they don't make a dent in some of the other ones, some of the emotional symptoms in particular. And so we really need more people working on developing interventions that could coexist alongside medication, but that can really work to uh, give people with schizophrenia, their families, um, some hope that, that, uh, that um, some of these symptoms can be conquered. And most importantly, not just um, removing the symptoms, but that people's quality of lives can be improved. Uh, so that I think is, we need more people studying severe mental illness in psychology, uh, in neuroscience, and then working to translate uh, the work into effective psychosocial interventions. So then for those who are watching this interview today, um, maybe it's students, maybe it's other mental professionals or the public, um, what advice would you have for them about you know, their interest or desire to get involved in the field? Well, I, you know, there's a lot of myths about schizophrenia that, um, you know, people like me, when I went to graduate school, I was like, oh, that's scary. I, I don't want anything to do with that. But it's not very scary. Some of the bravest people I've ever met are the people with uh, schizophrenia who deal with this profound illness in a society, at least in the United States, that uh, shuns them or wants to put them in jail um, or wants them just out of sight. Um, but people with schizophrenia are not violent. Uh, they're far more likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators of violence. Yes, someone with a severe mental illness can be violent um, if they're not treated, um, but that is certainly not the norm. And so dispelling some of the myths about schizophrenia so people aren't so scared uh, about it and, and worried that somebody with this illness is gonna be violent um, can, I, I hope, reduce the stigma associated with it. and. Um, uh, and so that we realize at, um, at the core of any person with uh, severe mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, it's a person and that we can really uh, recognize um, that we need to uh, embrace people with a severe mental illness as a person and um, respect their dignity as a human being instead of uh, shunning them or uh, pushing them aside or blaming them for uh, whatever uh, the latest um, societal problem or challenge that we face. Thank you so much. That's a really important and powerful response. And thank you also for speaking today, Anne. Happy to, to do it. Yeah, thank you.